Pleasure to be here. Thanks to Arjun and the crew from OSDC. Um, it's great to be back in the loving arms of the open source community again after a few years away. Um, as Arjun said, I'm Richard Keach. Um, the topic of my talk is fairly narrowly focused as I pitched it to Arjun. And, um, and then he said, well, you can be a keynote. So I figure that gives me a little bit of latitude to wander a bit more broadly uh, and give you a bit of the backstory here. So th consider that as well as telling the story about a Linux-based monitoring and control in a sustainable house, it's also a bit about the greening of a Linux geek, which is me. Um, okay, think of this talk as being at the intersection of three sets. One is tech, stuff that I like. Two is creative, so it's the coding is creative. And sustainability, which is my new hobby horse. So you are here. It's the sweet spot for things that interest me. And I hope they interest you too. Um, and Linux Geek, well, it's probably appropriate for me to better introduce myself. I don't know that many of you. Um, I started in the open source community when I attend, had the good fortune of attending uh, the first conference of the uh, Free Software Foundation uh, in Boston in 1980, uh, 1997 and met Linus and Richard Stallman and, and other luminaries. And um, subsequently I worked for Cybersource in Melbourne and then I uh, had the good fortune of um, joining Red Hat when they started in, in, in Australia in, in 2000. So I worked for Red Hat for 10 years, um, became the first uh, Red Hat certified engineer in the world. Um, so the, yeah, that's my Linux and open source credentials, if you like. Um, but then something happened along the way. Uh, but there, there are convergence of two things here. Uh, first, the genesis of an idea. In 2003, uh, Michael Tiemann, who uh, at the time, I don't know whether people know the name Michael Tiemann, he founded uh, Cigna Solutions, an early open source company. He was the uh, original creator of G++. Um, uh, he became, uh, Red Hat bought Cygnus and, and so I met uh, Michael and he presented at a, at a Linux conference in about uh, in a Red Hat internal conference in about 2003, and on one of his slides he he presented a diagram with uh, an intriguing um, notion that basically in every home there would be this extensible modular and ubiquitous server, open source based of course, um, and I thought that was a pretty cool idea. Um, so possible capabilities might be a secure internet gateway, uh, provide smart home control, energy management, security, media and en entertainment. Um, this is kind of going a little against the trend these days with so many things moving into the cloud, but I still think this idea has something going for it. Um, so park that idea for a moment. That, that, I thought that was an interesting notion and it sort of sat in the back of my mind. In, in the meantime, um, something else happened. Uh, I had my oh shit um, moment of watching An Inconvenient Truth and realised that climate change was um, really big, big, big stuff. Um, uh, so at that moment I realised that I, I really had to do something. Um, and then shortly thereafter I read a book called Climate Code Red written by two Australian guys, David Spratt and Philip Sutton, that I, I realised then that I, it wasn't enough just for me to do something by myself, I had to do something and tell people about it. So um, and therein laid the seeds of me actually leaving Red Hat and, and changing career uh, out of open source and, and uh, into the environment space. So at the end of 2009, so yeah, so, so, so end, of, yeah, end of 2009, so 2000 to 2009 inclusive, that's 10 years I worked for Red Hat. Uh, and then in 2010, um, I went back to uni and did a Masters of Environment. Um, so graduating in 2011 and uh, uh, taking advantage of my engineering background, I, I did that Masters in Energy Efficiency. Um, so these days I call myself an Energy Efficiency or Renewable Energy Consultant. 
Uh, I've got some expertise in uh, sustainable buildings. Uh, and I'm writing a book on home energy efficiency at the moment. It should be out next year. Uh, and the other point about where I'm at is I'm a lot more poorly paid than I was working at Red Hat. So if, if you are thinking of making a jump in my direction, don't do it for the money. Okay, um, so some things that uh, I, I can take credit for um, in, in the last uh, six or seven years. I've managed to uh, get a zero emission sustainable home retrofit. Um, more about that in a minute. Um, I'm playing a, what I think is a, a key role in an important environmental NGO um, that's beyond zero emissions. Uh, I was the lead author of a, of, an, of a landmark report on sustainable buildings released last year. Um, and of course the monitoring and control system which is um, a bit of a side project but um, I'm, I'm flattered that Ian thought it was interesting enough to warrant speaking to you about it today. Um, so just a little bit of background about the house which is being monitored. Um, I'm very pleased at having been able to reduce the energy from uh, 2006, which is a baseline year, um, and subsequent improvements have, have seen that I've reduced the energy consumed by the house by 75% including getting rid of gas entirely, gas is the, the red, and uh, the yellow is the electricity generation. So at the moment I'm, I'm using about uh, 20 gigajoules of energy a year and I'm generating slightly more than that. So, so I've gone from pretty well stock average for your Melbourne, um, Melbourne suburban home to quite a bit better. And, 75% reduction in gross and 100% reduction in net energy. But that's a whole different topic. So that, that sort of serves as the basis for, for, for looking at the monitoring system um, that, that I'm going to look at, which is the, so the, the open source develop aspect of this whole talk. Um, so the home monitoring system, what, what's it do? Well, it, it lets me monitor temperature, seven sensors plus a, a stream from the Bureau of Meteorology to get the outside temperature. Uh, monitoring power, uh, I've got eight power sensors uh, plus communicating directly with my smart meter uh, and it gives me some limited device control, uh, three water sensors and, and a web-based interface. So let's talk about that. Uh, to understand fully uh, what's going on here, it's really useful to, to know a bit more about smart meters and, and smart grids uh, because I've tried to take advantage of that to the extent that I can. Um, smart meters have rolled out in Victoria, um, pretty well complete now. Um, I, I think they have to a small extent in, in Queensland but not, not very much. Um, anyone know what the situation with smart meters is in, in this state? No? Not much? Yeah? Not happening? Yeah, I think there was a trial and, and that was about it. But anyway, smart meters uh, are the future, so hopefully you'll find this interesting. Um, broadly speaking, a smart meter is a, a, a digital uh, power meter in a house, plus two important things. One is uh, a connection from the meter to the, dis the power distributor. Uh, it's usually a wireless connection uh, and that lets the, the power distributor um, meter, uh, remote, remotely collect the metering information. And the second aspect of smart meters as, as they exist today is a home area network. So you might not be aware that smart meters have a, uh, a wireless network that allows devices inside the home to talk to the meter. More about that in a minute. So this is the, sort of the architecture with um, the smart meter here, the potential for the smart meter to, to talk uh, uh, to the power network and devices in the home to talk to the meter and potentially uh, devices in the home to be controlled via the smart meter as well. So it's, it's quite an interesting capability and it opens up a lot of options. Uh, but in terms of what I've done with that, uh, oh, just in terms, in, in Victoria they call this the network between the meter and the, uh, and the, and the power grid, the advanced metering infrastructure. AMI and the, uh, the standard, or the protocol uh, used on the home area network wireless is called Zigbee. More about that in a minute. Okay, 
The fact that the, uh, the power company can get your data remotely um, opens up some interesting possibilities because it's just as easy for them to get the data every 15 minutes as it is to get it once every three months. Uh, so they do get it uh, periodically. Um, they call it interval data, so it's a time series. Uh, it's running continually pretty well, uh, sampled at about every 30 minutes. So, uh, so the meters pushes data out to the, to the AMI. Uh, it's every 30 minutes. And it has this notion of consumption and generation. So obviously, w when you're consuming, that's consumption. When the house is generating power, that's generation. That's obvious, but why am I saying that? Because uh, there's, some, there's a terminology issue. If, if you're uh, solar panels are generating two kilowatts and you're consuming one kilowatt in, internally, then from the point of view of the power company you're generating one kilowatt even though you're actually generating two. So just be aware of that terminology. Uh, so from the power company's point of view your generation is not the same as your actual generation. Um, some power companies uh, make that interval data available to customers via a portal. Uh, it's graphical and interactive, and you can also download uh, CSV data if, to put it in a spreadsheet. This is, this is my power company's presentation to me of, of my data. You get the idea, it's a uh, fairly uh, a neat representation, uh, and it's current up to about four hours old. So it's, compared to getting uh, your power bill once every three months, and, and and just getting that very coarse grain view with, with, with that historical perspective. This is pretty close to real time. But uh, if you're monitoring in the house, then four hours old is probably not real time enough. Um, which brings me to Zigbee. Zigbee is this standard that um, implements a home area network. It, it's yet another thing on the 2.4 giga, gigahertz ISM band in your home as if we didn't have enough things to, to, uh, to com compete with our Wi-Fi, um, along with Bluetooth and cordless phones. We, we've now got this. So it's a 250 kilobit uh, wireless network. So devices uh, such as in-home displays can talk directly to the, to the meter. Um, it's reading authoritative information from the meter rather than just some uh, uncalibrated representation of that. So if, if your in-home display says you're consuming 450 watts, that's actually what the, what, what the power company says is an authoritative measure. So no CT required. CT is a current transformer. So another way that in-home displays can work is that you, you plug this wi wireless dongle thingy in your meter box and wrap a, a current transformer around a wire and, and it transmits a, a representation of, of your power consumption. So with Zigbee you don't need that. It's, it's direct communications with the meter and you don't need an electrician to, to get into a meter box. So it gives you near real time. It's still not completely real time. So uh, it's delayed by about 15 to 45 seconds. So average about 30 seconds old. So that, that's pretty close to real time but if what you want to do is uh, figure out how much power your kettle's drawing, you can't expect it to see uh, the, the power jump up immediately when you turn a kettle on. Uh, it, it shows the solar exports as well. Uh, and it provides a capability, uh, currently unused, of the, the power company mess sending messages through the metering infrastructure uh, and via the home area network to your in-home display. So if the metering if the power company says, hey, we, we want you to uh, or be aware there's a peak power event, that can go straight to the display in your kitchen. So the Zigbee device connection is interesting from a technical point of view. Um, to this audience, uh, it, you might be interested to know it's a, an encrypted uh, connection, 128-bit elliptic curve encryption. Uh, and, and why that's important is that you don't want your neighbours being able to figure out what your electricity loads are because they can figure out when you're not there and so on. So it's a privacy thing. Um, so the, the devices like in-home displays bind 
to, to the service. Um, and that that's, involves a MAC address and a device specific key called an installation number or an installation code. Um, so uh, in, in my case, I've got a number of registered devices on, on my, um, through my service. The same portal that gives me access to the, um, to my, uh, via the web, to my uh, interval data gives me the, the means of controlling and seeing what registered devices I have. Um, so in my case, and, and bringing this back to my monitoring system, the, the way I uh, talk to my smart meter is using a Raven. This is a, just a little uh, USB dongle um, that talks uh, Zigbee straight to the smart meter. Uh, so I've worked with the distributor and written uh, in Python a, a, a daemon that runs on Linux that uh, allows you to have a service that, that uh, gets that information uh, continually. Um, so this dongle shows up as a USB device on Linux. Um, it looks like that in the output of LS USB. Uh, it uses the FTDI drivers and it shows up as a, um, as a, U a TDY USB type of device uh, and the communications with it is using an XML based protocol. Um, so uh, here's, here's an example, uh, via that USB uh, TDY connection uh, you might send that, that XML uh, to the device and it might send back that and you have to interpret that. Uh, to get, uh, uh, in this case, uh, the command is get current summation and, and embedded in there is what the instantaneous power is. Okay, the other technology I've used in my monitoring and control system is one wire bus. Um, if you're not aware with, of one wire bus, it's a low power, uh, low cost, low data rate, uh, bus topology type of instrumentation network. It's like I2C, that, that instrumentation bus that runs around inside your motherboard on a computer, but it's longer range and slower. Uh, it's called one wire because in theory, uh, you just need one uh, data and power carried over the one wire plus a ground. Uh, in practice, you tend to have the power carried separately because it gives you longer range and, and um, more reliability. So uh, the, the one wire uh, adapters I'm using are, are these ones, um, they look like that. And that looks like an, an RJ45 socket, but it's not, it's actually an RJ11 six wire connection. And um, it runs around the house and I've got sensors for temperature, humidity, moisture, Oh, these are the possible types of sensors you might have. I don't have them all. Temperature, humidity, moisture, counters, relay control. So it's quite versatile. You can, uh, you can run a long string running around various places in the house and, and, and have various passive and active things along that, along that line. Okay, the way that presents on a Linux machine, um, it mounts uh, a, a virtual file system under run OWFS in my case uh, and uh, those items there that look like addresses are, are the individual um, components or individual probes that are on the bus. So each, each device like a temperature probe has a unique uh, address that's a factory set in the hardware. Um, so some issues that I found, I found there were some reliability issues when going through a USB hub. So um, that was a hard learned lesson. Um, uh, that's, uh, I'll skip over that. The bus length works, you're talking tens of metres long, so it's quite versatile, but it's, it's tolerant to some branching. So you can have, um, uh, you're not strictly required to have one line running all the way along. You can just branch off a, uh, a meter here and a meter there. Um, you can have multiple, multiple adapters in, in the same computer um, and it'll still present as one unified set of devices. 
so I think I'm not sure what the upper limit theoretical on the number of devices is. I've got over 14 devices, and they all, all the devices are powered from the USB. Um, so you don't need a separate power. You, you can inject power into the USB bus as well, but I've found it unnecessary. Um, for some reason, I find the reading of temperatures quite slow, but it's no big deal. So here's an example. Uh, of sort of first principles reading of, of uh, temperature. So, so that address 28 dot blah 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 corresponds to a temperature probe. Uh, it's a, it's a, a folder, a directory in that virtual file space and it, it, it's got all these entries. So one of these temperature is the actual virtual file that lets you read uh, the actual temperature. So if I just cat that then you can see that's giving me a, a real-time reading of the temperature on that probe. So power um, was a little different. Um, the way I've done that is, um, uh, again, still with one wire, um, I found a supplier of um, a pulse counter. So this is a one wire pulse counter. So it's got a little battery on it. So if you lose power, you don't lose the, the, uh, the, the, the count. And so one wire in one side, uh, and then uh, that, that's connected to uh, a DIN rail submeter module. So that's what this is. This goes in your meter box, and uh, you can wire it up so you know mains in one side, and a pulse out the other side. And it's not really a pulse, it's just a, a switch that closes. So you've got to you know, put in five volts in one side and the other wire returning, it will be a pulse 5 volts and that's what you count with with this on the one wire bus and voila you can count um, the number of times that uh, one watt hour of electricity gets consumed so if you know your baseline number which you read off there and you can calibrate so that every time you get a pulse you increment the power consumed and hopefully your tally of power consumed will agree with what's on the meter so different Types of these have different precisions. Some have one watt hour, some have 10 watt hours. Um, so we're directly reading the pulse counts and we can, like I said, infer the kilowatt hours based on the calibration. Uh, it works both on loads, so like a, uh, a circuit within your house or it can work on an inverter uh, connected to your solar panels. So you can, you can measure generation as well as consumption. So I'm reading water as well. Uh, so I'm using the same pulse counting system, but um, I'm generating the pulses with the water meter. The water meters that uh, I've found in Melbourne, um, maybe here as well, actually have the facility for a pulse probe to go in them. So I didn't have to buy special water meters, I just had to buy a pulse probe from, from Reese Hardware and uh, take out the little uh, uh, covering panel from the, the hole on the, on the water meter and plug this probe in and voila, I had a source of uh, water consumption data as well. So depending on the type of meter, it might, it'll either give uh, one pulse for every half a litre or five litres. Um, and in my case, I've got my mains water and I've also got a water meter on my uh, hot water service and on my um, water, uh, rainwater tank. So I can keep a track of what's going on. So um, in terms of controlling power via the system, uh, I found uh, a one-wire I.O. port. So it's a, it's a device that's on the one-wire bus and you can uh, switch uh, relays. Um, and in, in my case, I've chosen to switch 12 volt control signals. Um, and using uh, a DIN rail contactor, which is just like a high, high current relay, which is switched with 12 volts. Um, I put that in the meter box, uh, it gives me a manual override as well. So that, it looks like that. Um, so in that you see, um, oh, it's a bit hard to see, that's the contactor and that's just to control one, um, one circuit, which at the moment isn't being used, but it will be in the near future. Uh, the whole arrangement, I won't go through it, but suffice to say that's a rough sketch of, uh, of it. it. It's you know, got quite a few probes and 
um, devices on it. So, okay. So in summary, the, the setup uh, uses Zigbee, uh, one-wire sensors. Uh, I'm sampling them every five minutes. Uh, so th six temperature, th three water, seven power. Uh, and, and that one wire control option for, for some power circuits which I'm, I'm not currently using. Um, so the controller, the back end of all this, um, I started down this using a Raspberry Pi and, and I know everyone here knows what a Raspberry Pi is and I was talking to Arjun this morning about his experiences with Raspberry Pi. Uh, so Raspberry Pi with Pedora. Um, so I had some issues with that. Uh, the distro is obviously doesn't have the same critical mass as other distros. Um, ARM, as a processor, architecture is nice, low powered, uh, nice and cheap. But um, I found there were some stability issues with with uh, USB, especially when plugged into a hub, um, and it's it's quite limited in its capability. Uh, one one example of the limitation of the uh, Raspberry Pi that annoyed the hell out of me was it's got no real-time clock. So if, if, if the server boots up and it doesn't have access to the network then it goes back to 1970, which is a, a bit annoying. So uh, I've actually switched over uh, from the Raspberry Pi to using the NUC. Uh, NUC is a platform from Intel which um, doesn't directly compete with the Raspberry Pi but it is it's a x86 based very low, uh, very low electrical power a consumption uh, device, and and given what's in it, uh, it, it from a compute point of view, it's much much faster, uh, and, and from an electrical power point of view, it's not that much more. So instead of about three and a half watts for the Raspberry Pi, it's about seven watts, which I, I can live with, even though I want to use as less electricity as I can. So enough with Fedora. I'm using a main scene distro, uh, so I'm, I'm uh, getting the maturity of that. Uh, it's more versatile. Uh, it's got three onboard USB uh, compared with uh, uh, Raspberry Pi, it's only got two. So I no longer need a hub. So it looks like that. Um, so you can see there's the, the one wire um, adapter. Um, that's, that's the USB off to the, uh, the Raven uh, Zigbee dongle and uh, the other USB is for my console. Uh, I've got a 16 channel pulse counter so it's basically a box with uh, eight of these things all stacked up so I can bring in all the pulse readings into one place. Uh, and this is a multi-channel I.O. board that lets me control uh, the power. So that, that's, the, that's the hardware, that's the nitty gritty of, of my attempt to try and uh, get a smart control and monitoring for my home. Uh, but it needs a front end, it needs a, a way of um, uh, displaying all this information. It's arguably the, the more interesting aspect of this is, is um, making the data available to, to the homeowner, being me. So um, I've only uh, got this working in the last few weeks, so uh, it's reasonably hot off the press. I'm using a, uh, an open source project called Open Home Automation Bus or Open Hab. Um, it's a cross-platform Java-based framework. It, it works on Windows, Linux, Mac, you name it. It uses uh, a Java framework called OSGI. It's a pluggable architecture for services. Uh, like I said, it's all open source. Uh, as a project, it's got, uh, it, it seems quite mature. I've only been using it a short time, but in that, in that time I've come to appreciate that uh, they've got uh, input from pretty well all, a very large range of hardware providers that do things that are of interest to people that do smart homes. So there's uh, what are called bindings to different types of hardware, including one wire uh, and, lo and uh, lots of other things. So there's like dozens of, of bindings for different types of hardware you might use in a smart home. Uh, it's, it's good for monitoring, not, not only monitoring but also control. In other words, uh, you can um, 
turn things on and off using this system. So uh, in terms of the presentation of that, it provides a mobile friendly website. Uh, it works with Android. Oh, there's an Android and an iOS app as well, so you can either use it through a browser or, or through an app uh, on your mobile. And the way I've got it set up is my, um, that NUC computer, uh, I've got it set up through my ISP with a static IP address. Um, so the, uh, the router does port forwarding to the NUC on port 8443. Uh, and uh, so whether I'm at home or away from home, um, I can access the presentation of, of, of this information. So when I'm at home, my NUC obviously has an internal um, private IP address, so I've got a split DNS zone, so when my uh, device tries to resolve the name internally, it gets that private address. When I'm outside, I, I resolve the uh, public address um, of my, um, of my uh, gateway. I'm using SSL plus a password to make sure that no one else can access it. And let's see what it looks like. Um, I've got some snapshots of it there, but I think I've got it live and working, so that will be more interesting. So let's see how this works. So that's live at my place. Let's just do a, a refresh to see this last updated at 10.16, which is Melbourne time, which is pretty well real time. Um, so we've got uh, the, these are from the one wire bus sensors of temperature. But if I look at the outside, if I click on that, and that's, I've also, so this is the one wire bus temperature and I'm also getting a feed from the Bureau uh, to get their idea of what the temperature is. And there's a large discrepancy there. That, that, that's characteristic in the mornings when I've actually got sun, sun, the sun shining on the temperature sensor in the morning, so I'm going to have to fix that up. Um, so, and it graphs it fairly nicely. I can do hour, day and week, um, so you get a nice visual representation of what's going on. Uh, so this is the, uh, the information presented from that communication directly with the smart meter. So that uh, minus 3,820 watts is um, the, the, my meter's in, uh, understanding of that, that power at that, at that moment, um, which is probably in the order of 30 seconds to a minute old. Uh, so I've got a five kilowatt uh, set of arrays on my home, so that's going pretty well at the moment. Nice and sunny in Melbourne today. So um, I've already uh, exported five and a half kilowatt hours and it's still early days uh, for today. So today I'll probably generate about uh, 30 kilowatt hours. Um, so we can drill down. Actually, let's have a look at this one. So this is real time. The consumption, these are just the consumption. So each of these lines corresponds to one of the power sensors. So this yellow line, that's when my electric car charged last night. So I can see that my wife charged the car. Um, I've put this one represented like that with the underscore there because that fridge circuit is actually a subset of, of this circuit here. Uh, so these don't strictly add up. Um, so these are instantaneous powers. Hang on, we'll go back into that. So that's the loads and the, the generation. Um, I've got three arrays. One of them isn't um, the, the, the um, power uh, sensing for one of the arrays isn't working properly, so I'm only seeing two of the three. Um, so one's, uh, you, oh, they, they are as they seem there. So this gives a good representation of, of it visually. One of the arrays, the, the solar array one, is the red one. It gets a little bit of morning shade, so you can see that the output of that array is delayed by about an hour compared with this one until the sun uh, advances far enough so that this one starts to, 
um, get out of the shadow and then jumps up when, when it's uh, unshaded sufficiently. The, f the line's fairly jumpy, so it tells me that it's probably uh, got uh, overcast, uh, or clouds, a, a bit of cloud moving past the sun from time to time, otherwise that would be a nice smooth line. So you can see yesterday, you get this nice sinusoidal output showing uh, the, the power during the day with, with blips when there's been a bit of cloud. So that's power. Let's look at energy. So this is so far today. Um, you can see what different things have used. So overnight, the car, or since midnight, I used about two kilowatt hours charging the car. Um, the fridge, the rest of the house. Um, the hot water hasn't boosted today. Aircon's not running. And uh, the representation here is a cumulative representation which resets at midnight. Hence, hence that blip. And water. Um, my mains water sensor is not working properly at the moment, but you can see uh, hot water and rainwater are showing up. And, and this is just uh, looking at the hot water only. So you can see no hot water use. Uh, and then my wife had a shower, then... Uh, so she got up quite early this morning. <laughs> it, it, it's, um, it's public holiday in Melbourne today, so I thought she would have slept in. Well, some, someone got up early. Maybe that was her getting up there. It was probably my son getting up there. So you get the idea. Oops. We're nearly done. Let's just sit down to the end. Okay, um, it, it's largely up and running and I'm pretty happy with the, the monitoring system and, and, and what it shows. There's a few glitches that I have to fix with a couple of sensors not working. Um, but the main thing that uh, is a, is a to-do on, on my system is um, in integrating it in with my hot water service control. So I've got a professional interest in uh, efficient hot water systems. Uh, I, I co-wrote the Alternative Technology Association's guide on efficient hot water. Um, so I'm interested in making my hot water service work as efficiently as possible and, and I'm, I think there's some scope to integrate the control of the boosting of the hot water service in with, with my smart home arrangement to take advantage of uh, things like uh, smarter algorithms taking weather information into account uh, and in particular partial human in the loop. So here's a scenario. Um, the, the, the dumb hot water service sees the temperature drop below a threshold temperature in the morning after some showers, uh, even though, you know, this is a solar hot water service, uh, even though within a couple of hours the water is going to be heated by the sun, but the controller doesn't know that. So the controller says, well, I have to boost. But imagine if the controller can ask me as, as the occupant, hey, is anyone going to need hot water in the next couple of hours? And if you say yes or no, and if, if the answer is no, then it defers that boosting and then lets the sun do its work efficiently. But if the answer is yes, then it'll boost it immediately because you know, someone's about to have a shower. So that's an example of, of how um, this thing can actually help me uh, potentially use less energy, use energy more cleverly. Uh, to, to get that working, I, I'll need a notification system. So for example, I have a pebble watch. Uh, so my, in, in my uh, uh, dreams of I'd, li I'd like to integrate this thing through to an, an app on, on the Android so that that notification, that question asked by the smart home system comes straight through to my watch and I just say yes or no. Um, so I think that would be fairly cool. So a project for next time. Uh, 
Another thing for, for home use that I'm going to uh, add to it um, is just some smarts about what devices are being used and when in the home. So uh, we've got some, uh, shall we say, well, I, have a, I have two teenage children, so uh, internet access is contentious from a home policy management point of view, shall we say. So um, being able to uh, understand and control internet access is sometimes a useful thing. My children uh, probably regret that they have a, a geek as a dad. They, they, they can't pull the wool over my eyes. So anyway, that ends my talk. And uh, we're pretty well on time. Thanks. So I think it's morning tea.